Beyond regular teeth brushing, a good number of Nigerians hardly prioritize oral health, except in severe conditions such as pain or discomfort. Even then, some prefer to numb the pain with painkillers and would only visit the dentist as a last resort. The Global Burden of Disease study estimated that oral diseases affect over 3.5 billion people worldwide. But why do we have such numbers in the high occurrence? Why are people shy of booking a visit with their dentists or oral health professionals? As we gear up for the World Oral Health Day, can a happy mouth make a happy body? This is the Eastern Eye. I am Alex Obodo. Welcome to the Eastern Eye on Afia TV, where we X-ray the political, social, and economic developments around us. With plaque cavity and mouth odor ravaging quite a good number of Nigerians, what must be done to save the population of this health embarrassment? My guests tonight are Dr. Aniaboso Kelechi. He's Assistant Director, Dental Therapists, University of Nigeria, Teaching Hospital, Ituku Azala, Enugu. He is also the state chairman, Nigerian Dental Therapists Association, Enugu State Chapter. He is joined tonight on the Eastern Eye by Oji Happiness. She is Assistant Director, Dental Therapist, University of Nigeria, Teaching Hospital, Ituku Azala. She is also a lawyer, just in case, uh, just to put that out there. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, tonight on the Eastern Eye. I think this, this is the first time I'm interviewing health professionals who are uh, on the oral side of things. So I will naturally would want to start with the lady, uh, OGE Happiness. Uh, I've heard, because reading through all this, I'm seeing that you're saying dental therapists. Uh, some people are quite used to hearing dentists. So who is a dental therapist? Is, is he different from a dentist? Thank you very much, Alex. I'm glad to be here. A dental therapist is a member of the dental team whose area of specialization is in the prevention of oral diseases. You can as well say that a dental therapist is, a, is part of the public oral health care, a public oral health care practitioner. Okay, so we specialize, we deal more on the prevention of oral health disease, oral diseases, just like the saying goes that prevention is always better than cure. We belong to the preventive dentistry. And coming to the second aspect of your question, you said, what is the difference between a dentist and a dental therapist? In actual fact, Every practitioner in the dental family can be referred to as a dentist. But what perhaps a lot of people don't know is the fact that in the dental family, there are different areas of specialization. There are different professionals in the dental family. For instance, you have a dental surgeon, you have a dental therapist, you have a dental technologist, you have a dental surgery assistant, and you have a dental nurse. These professionals come together to form the dental team and all can actually be referred to as dentists. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for laying that out for us. And uh, let me come to you, uh, Dr. Ania Borsa. The, the whole talk about uh, how often people should visit the dental therapist or dentist, whichever one now we, we have decided to go with, so, why do you think people are shy in making that visit to uh, a dental therapist or a dentist? Well, I mean, whatever it is, why are people shy about it? Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Alex. People are shy basically because they are not informed. Many people are not dentally aware of what they ought to do. And normally, once every six months, a human being should visit a dentist, irrespective of um, the fact he or she is having any dental problem, just for check, normal check, a, a, a routine check. 
every normal human being should visit the dentist once every six months. First is to check if there's any disease, any oral or dental disease that is coming so that it can be arrested before it you know, gets enlarged or something. So basically, people are uh, not aware. And part of this program is to create the awareness that people should know. In fact, a child should be introduced to the dentist as young as from age two. You know, you should introduce the child so that the child gets used to the dentist. Mm. So that is it. So people are not really aware. That's why they shy away. Yeah, that's uh, you used two words that yeah. got my attention. It said dental awareness. Yes. And it, it looks like it's, it's, it's a very expensive commodity here in Nigeria. And how do you get people to the point of awareness that uh, they don't resort to self-medication? You know, because uh, people tend to want to solve those problems themselves. You are having a little, a little bit of pain. You quickly go to Google okay. and, and ask Google what to do instead of going to a professional who spent uh, a good five, six years or even seven years of their lives studying how to take care of the, the, the human oral health. Yeah. Actually, um, like I said, what we are doing now is to create awareness. To tell people that you don't need to self-medicate. It's very dangerous. In fact, uh, through our studies, through our movement, through our visits, we notice that people do a lot of harmful practices. Like some people still use charcoal in cleaning their teeth. Some people still use sharp sand. Some people grind eggshells and they use it to clean their teeth because they feel that it, it whitens teeth. But all these are fallacies. <laughs> In fact, some people, when they have dental problem, maybe pains or something, they take their urine to pour into it and say that it will heal. All these are fallacies. Do you understand? So um, our aim as a dental therapist, we educate people. We go to schools. We go to hospitals. We go to markets, many places, just to create this awareness because we are the vanguard of oral health. That's what we are doing, and that's what actually brought us to this place, to tell people, for people to get to know that they should visit a dentist once every six months. You don't need to, um, and a whole lot of things that we'll still talk about, maybe mm. brushing, um, mm. some people use toothpicks, some people use um, many things that shouldn't be. Some mm. people use their teeth in opening drink. It's very wrong. Mm. Yes. Interesting. We'll, we'll come to the harmful practices. But let's talk about the things that can happen if one refuses to go for those routine checks. You said six months, uh, uh, GE happiness. Let's, let's find out what could happen if someone fails to keep those six monthly uh, visits or appointments, and maybe that six months turns to five years, and then turns to 10 years. What, what, what could likely happen to such a person? And obviously someone who's ha having a sign or two of oral problem. Thank you very much, Alex. It's very unfortunate that in this climb, in our climb, that the awareness, the level of dental health awareness is at a very low. Unlike what we have in the Western world, our people have this belief that a dental problem can never send you to the grave. But the truth is that a dental problem can actually send one to the grave. How do I mean? There are certain dental situations that when you don't handle them, you don't need them at the board, there could be complications. Uh, I don't intend to, to bore you with... Um, professional jargons now. You, you, I mean, you, you, you may want to deploy them. Yeah. Uh, if you ask, and I'll ask you what it means. Yeah. That's just what it yeah. is. <laughs> okay. Something as little as one brushing and noticing that the gum is bleeding. It is enough to send a signal that all is not well. But by the time such a little thing is ignored, it continues to get worse 
and eventually the gums will begin to recede. When we mean say the gum recedes, the gum will continue to go down. And as the comb is going down, pushing backwards, the teeth will get more and more exposed. And the reason why the gum is bleeding is because there are microorganisms that are attacking the gum. These microorganisms, after attacking the gum, can go down and begin to attack the tooth substance. It can as well, you know, progress to the point of attacking the bone substances that are holding the tooth in place. And when this happens, you see that the teeth are beginning to shake and eventually those teeth could get lost. They could, they could fall off on their own or the pain may become so unbearable and at that stage, that tooth may not be salvaged anymore and it will be lost. Okay? Apart from that, when there, is complete, there, are, well, there are complex dental issues like in cases of periodontitis, gingivitis, when we say periodontitis, we mean inflammation of the bones that support the teeth. And gingivitis is the swelling of the gum tissues. The bacteria that are involved in all these disease conditions, they can even progress to the point of, you know, these things are in the body, they are in the bloodstream, and they are traveling down. They can even progress to the point of getting to the other parts of the body. They can attack the heart. There is what we call bacteria endocarditis. This could be one of the complications of periodontal diseases. So that is why it is very good that one should visit a dental therapist once, at least once every six months. Yes, I, I want you to explain the endocarditis, uh, whatever it is. Uh, I want you to break it down a little more. Okay, well, bacteria endocarditis is um, this, the inflammation of the heart as a result of the presence of bacteria around the area. And this bacteria may have tracked down from a diseased tooth or a diseased supporting tooth supporting bone. But everything that is happening in the oral cavity, and that is why we say that the mouth is the gateway into the body. Whatever that goes into our body passes through the mouth. So that is why we have to take very good care of our oral health so that some of these complications could be prevented. Again, a, a, a dental problem that is not handled uh, on time or maybe if, when it is eventually being managed, probably not managed well, could lead to severe situations. You know, some, there's something we call ameloblastoma. It's, it is a cancer of the, of the enamel substance of the teeth. You know, the teeth, we have the enamel, we have the dentin, we have the cementum and the pulp, okay? The enamel is the outer covering of the teeth, okay? It can affect the enamel, it can affect the dental the supporting bones of the teeth. Although the, the, the causes of ameloblastoma may really not be known, the etiology may really not be known, but poor oral health can actually predispose one to this ameloblastoma, which is a variant of tumor that, it, though when it starts immediately, it may not be cancerous, but if it is not handled well, can become cancerous. Very uh, interesting. Uh, I think uh, the conversation is getting interesting. Uh, Dr. Anya Warsaw, mm -hmm. let's, let's find out uh, one of the commonest things uh, you would notice when someone has an oral health challenge is mouth odor. I'm sure there is a technical term for, for, for it yeah. in, in, your, in your field. Yes. Well, what do you call it? Okay, we call it halitosis. 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 I, know, I know, I didn't want to be the one to use that <laughs> term. I decided to use the word mouth odor, mouth odor. and I wanted you to say it. So, what would be the causes of halitosis, like, like you put it? What, what could be the things that could predispose one okay. to halitosis? Um, halitosis, like we said, is bad breath. Um, it's a common thing in, um, in the society. In fact, so many people in the on the streets, everywhere, go about this um, bad breath. And the problem is that most people don't really know how to manage it because many people don't even know the origin. So I want to say that halitosis or bad breath can be caused by many things. Number one, we have the physiological causes of halitosis. We have the pathological causes of halitosis. 
Then we even have um, some other halitosis that, you know, but let's go to the ones that, uh, that is very common. Some people, when they do not brush their teeth, you know, when you ask that question the first time, what's the, the effect of not visiting a dentist or not going to a, 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 an oral health practitioner for, for dental care? Halitosis could be one of them. Because if you don't clean your teeth, or if you don't allow the professionals to handle your teeth, if you look at, the, if, if you look at people's mouths that, you know, don't regularly do their oral prophylaxis. They have stains, they have tartar, they have what you call dental calculus there, you know, and those things smell. In fact, when you remove them, they smell. So these things could cause halitosis, death. Apart from that, holes on the teeth can cause halitosis. You know, holes there that dental carries have decayed substances you eat food it's there it's packed there and with the uh, presence of bacteria in our mouth oral flora they will decompose them and normally the composed things smell so these are some of the things that make people's mouth to smell apart from that there are some systemic diseases that can make someone's teeth, uh, mouth to smell someone that uh, something like um, diabetes mellitus you know Reduction in um, salivary flow, you know, uh -huh. and many other things. Apart from that, people that have ulcer, their mouth can smell, and so many other factors. Mm. All right, uh, it's time for us to take a quick break here on the Eastern Eye. When we come back, we will talk about how to prevent issues like halitosis. Stay with us. We'll be right back. You're welcome back to the Eastern Eye here on Afia TV. We are reaching you live from Enugu, Southeast Nigeria with me, Alex Obodo. And I'm sitting here with the oral health therapists. All right, so we're having this very, very nice conversation. Um, let me come to you, uh, OG Happiness. What do we do to avoid situations that predispose us to having halitosis? And even tooth decay and uh, caries or cavity, whatever it is called. Thank you very much, Alex. The prevention of halitosis or the management of halitosis is dependent on the causative factor. That is what has caused or brought about the halitosis. First of all, let me address management before I go to prevention. Just like my colleague has mentioned, there could be different causes of halitosis. There could be a physiological halitosis. There could be a pathological halitosis. There could even be a psychosomatic halitosis, which is psychological. When you talk about psychosomatic halitosis, it is when a person feels that his or her mouth smells when in actual fact it doesn't. And in managing such halitosis, we do what we call placebo. Placebo is giving the patient the feeling that something has been done because it is psychological. You can carry out scaling and polishing, give home care oral, oral instructions, and perhaps maybe hand over some of this, uh, the materials you use in cleaning, okay? And then, um, of course, you counsel the patient. Make the patient to understand that in actual fact, your mouth doesn't smell. It is all in your mind. You know, you try to talk to the person so that the confidence could be built up, okay? That takes care of psychosomatic. Then pathological. The pathology that, breed, that brought about the halitosis has to be dealt with. If it is not dealt with, the halitosis never goes. If it is stomach ulcer, if it is diabetes, if it is dental caries, they have to be dealt with. And the moment they are dealt with, the halitosis go. The only halitosis that doesn't actually have a management is the 
physiological halitosis. And when we talk about physiological halitosis, what are we referring to? Hunger breath. You know, when somebody has not eaten for a, for a long time, like somebody hasn't been talking for a long time, the mouth is closed, it is expected that when the person speaks, some, you know, bad breath may come out. Another one is early morning bad breath. The mouth has been closed from the moment the person went to bed and till the moment the person is waking up in the morning, there is no saliva flow, the person doesn't talk, the person doesn't eat, because actually eating is a natural cleansing process. And that is why when one has not eaten, when one is fasting, the mouth can smell. When one wakes up in the morning, it does not matter how much you brush before you went to sleep at night. Bacterial activities has taken place in the mouth over the night. And it is naturally expected that the mouth will smell. So physiological halitosis, all you have to do is, if it is hunger breath, the moment you eat, it is taken care of. If it is um, early morning bad breath, you brush and you're good to go. Then coming to prevention. Prevention basically has to deal with the pathological uh, causes of halitosis, which are within the ambient of the dental therapist. Because if the pathological cause is something that a, a medical practitioner will handle or a surgeon will handle, you don't expect us to delve into that area. All we do is we refer. If we have to manage a, a pathological halitosis as a dental therapist, what is the cause? Is it gingivitis that causes it? Gingivitis is a inflammation of the gum. Is it periodontitis? Is it dental caries? If it is gingivitis, we do what we call oral toileting, scaling and polishing. It is a professional mouth cleaning proce uh, uh, procedure. We use instruments, we use certain machines, and we use certain medicaments as this process, process and procedure is going on to be able to give a thorough cleaning to, to, the, to the patient's mouth and then advise the patient on a very good home care. Okay, then if it is as a result of dental caries, we refer to the restorative dentist. The beautiful thing about the work of a dentist is that of a, of a dental therapist in the preventive dentistry is that he or she is the only one who makes sure that dental diseases don't come up in don't come up in the first place. Every other aspect of dental practice are now treatment of diseases, management of diseases. But if we should be able to come to a dental therapist and take good care of our oral health, yeah. we will not have any need. So you, you you are the gatekeepers? We are the gatekeepers, more or less. Yeah. Okay, that's a great one. Let me go come, come to you now, uh, Dr. Aniabosa. Um, what do we then do to escape the situations that are, you, they are explaining? Uh, there's talk about when someone should brush. Is it before eating or after eating? Is it morning or night? Is it three times a day? I mean, how do you brush? Is it up and down or sideways? Okay. So, uh, how do you brush your tongue? How do you clean your tongue? So, maybe you can you can uh, help us explain that. There's been a lot of arguments. Yes, I'm going to, to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do just that. Um, to if I, what you failed to mention was sometimes halitosis could come as a result of the food you've eaten. Some food are uh, um, is it pungent in um, smell, something like garlic, something like um, um, all this heavily spiced food. So it could equally cause halitosis, onions and all these things. So what do we do to curb halitosis? First of all, uh, we've established the fact that every human needs to visit an oral health professional once every six months. For prophylaxis what do i mean cleaning the teeth apart from the teeth the gum the surrounding tissues that's what we do basically so how do we do that how often should we brush our teeth we advocate that people brush their teeth two times every day last thing before you go to bed and after the breakfast why do we say last thing before you go to bed so that you remove every debris, every dirt, everything, you, you clean it off, and then 
go to bed and sleep. After cleaning, please don't take biscuits or any other thing, but you can take water. So that is it. And then in the morning, when you wake up, maybe you feel somehow like we talked about physiological halitosis, you can probably use water and wash your mouth and eat. After eating, you brush. The essence of brushing after food is to reduce the load, the depth, the time that um, plaque forms so that the teeth can be clean at least for a reasonable time. Again, you're supposed to, uh, while brushing, we are going to demonstrate how to brush. Yes, okay. we'll, 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 we'll come to that because we need to take a, a quick break. I've been told we need to go on a break. When we come back, you will explain what you want to explain and then you show us how we can brush, whether it is up and down or left to right. This is the Eastern Eye. We'll go on a break and we'll be right back. Stay with us. You're welcome back to the Eastern Eye here on Afia TV. We are on channel 254 on DSTV and channel 17 on Go TV. And we are live from Enugu, Southeast Nigeria. With me, Alex Ogodo. So it's time for us to know how we we'll brush our teeth. Uh, you know, a lot of things have been said about how we should brush our teeth. So I, I guess it's action time. <laughs> Let's find out who is doing the demo. Okay, Oji, uh, uh, happiness. Maybe you do us the honors of showing us exactly how we should brush our teeth. Uh, it's, it's a very important part of the discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. Um, the issue of there has been a lot of there have been a lot of controversies as to how exactly should the teeth be brushed. By the grace of God, this evening you are going to get the authentic information from the oral health professionals on how best to brush your teeth. But before we go into how to brush the teeth, how do you, what do you use in brushing your teeth? When you go into the market, there are a lot of toothbrushes. What we do not know, what the lay person doesn't know is that not every toothbrush is a good toothbrush. Okay. Not every toothbrush there is what we call an ideal toothbrush. Not every toothbrush is ideal. Mm -hmm. There are actually toothbrushes that are meant for the brushing of dentures. Their bristles are much more harder. But you find out that, ironically, some people prefer to make use of such toothbrushes, thinking that it cleans it, their teeth better. But the truth is that it damages the tissues of their teeth and even causes damages to the gall. So how do you know which toothbrush is an ideal toothbrush? I wouldn't want to bore you with the measurement of, of a two centimeter long head, the arrangement of the tuft and how long the handle should be. No, I wouldn't want to bore you with that because when you go into the market, you may not even see all these measurements. But this is basically what you have to look out for. Wonderfully enough, manufacturers of toothbrushes, they have done us the honor made it simpler for us to be able to make good choices of our toothbrushes. If you go to the market and pick up the pack of your toothbrush, first and foremost, look at the handle of the toothbrush. If it is long enough for you to have a firm grip on it and has these rough edges, you know, these rough lines on it such that when you're brushing, your toothbrush will not slip off, that is one of the indicators of a good toothbrush. Then secondly, the brushes are sealed, so you won't be able to touch the bristles to know whether they are soft, medium, or hard. But what do you do? Get the pack, look at the back. You will see an inscription of either hard, medium, or soft. A normal standard toothbrush should be the medium bristle toothbrush. There are people whom soft toothbrushes are meant for actually there are people who have just undergone oral surgeries. These are people we recommend soft toothbrushes for. Then you ask me who, use the, who uses the hard toothbrush. Hard toothbrushes are meant for cigarette smokers. Because of the cigarette stain, they need hard toothbrushes to be able to get rid of the stains. Now, let's go to how do you now make use of the brush? Before I go to the use of the brush, traditionally, our forefathers, even our uncles and aunties in the villages, a lot of them do not use toothbrush. They use chewing stick. 
You will not ask is the use of swing twin stick bad? The answer is no. Twin stick actually have been known to cause certain twin sticks have been known to have some medicinal values. But unfortunately, twin stick may not really be able to do a proper cleaning of the teeth. But that does not mean we have to throw it away completely. All we have to do is to guide the user on how best to use it so that the benefits could be maximized. When you chew the, the twin stick and it gets stuck, it gets soft, the end gets soft, just go to your teeth, just take it, take your tooth one at a time. Like you make use of your toothbrush, one tooth at a time, one tooth at a time, one tooth at a time. By the time you're done with the upper jaw, you go to the lower jaw and clean it one tooth at a time. But the challenge we have with toothbrush is with sorry, twin stick is that you find it difficult to use it on the inner part of your teeth. And that is why we advocate for the use of toothbrush. Now, how do you make use of your toothbrush? Do you brush up and down? Do you brush horizontally? No. Brushing up and down, up, down, up, down, all you end up doing is dragging food debris from down to up, dragging it from up to down again. And at the end of the day, you're not achieving anything. How about brushing horizontally across? You end up destroying the gum tissues. You end up destroying the teeth surfaces and what we call attrition. You end up having attrition on the teeth and holes will be created at the edges of the teeth because of wrong tooth brushing. How then do we brush cor correctly? When you want to brush in the morning, Please, I will advise that if this is your first time of practicing this, please start practicing in front of your mirror. With time, you'll get used to it. Just open your mouth slightly. This is a mouth model of what a, a, a live human mouth looks like. You can decide to start from the upper jaw. You can decide to start from the lower jaw. You can decide to start from the right hand side or the left hand side depending on whether, whether you are right-handed or left-handed. Now, you get your brush. You place, it at the, at the, you place it across at the edge, at the edge of the gum. Then you do a sweeping. You make a sweeping movement. You see? The hand rotates. That like you're, you're trying, the way you sweep your house. You make a sweeping movement. And this sweeping movement, one, enables the body of the brush to massage the gum. And then as the bristle comes down, it enters in between the teeth to remove whatever food debris that is there. You continue like that. An ideal toothbrush should be able to take at least three teeth at a time. You, you continue that sweeping method, three strokes at, at, on each, and you get to, to the other side of your teeth. Then you come to the inside, the same sweeping method. You sweep. Now, when you get to the front of the teeth, because of the, the, uh, the old curvature of the teeth, because of the arc, you know, you see the human mouth is an arc. You cannot sweep. That is only place we advise you place your toothbrush vertically and you brush out. By the time you're done with your front teeth, and you get to the to your twin teeth, you call the premolars and the molars, you continue with the sweeping. The only aspect of your teeth that you are permitted to brush backward and forward is your chewing, the chewing surfaces. That's the only place you brush backward and forward, backward and forward. What you have done, what you have just done on the upper jaw, you do exactly on the lower jaw, but this time it's just that the only difference is that it is in a different direction. On the upper jaw, you brush from red to white. You're brushing down. Always remember, red to white, red to white, red to white. On the lower jaw, you do the same. Red to white, red to white, red to white, red to white. When you get to the front teeth, you still place your toothbrush vertically and brush. Okay? Now, you cannot say you've done a proper cleaning of your mouth if you have not brushed the tongue. How do we brush the tongue? A lot of people will notice that when you're brushing, people
people say, I don't brush my tongue because when I brush, I vomit. The reason why you vomit when you brush is because of how you place your toothbrush when, you're brush, when you are trying to clean your, your tongue. If you place your tongue, your toothbrush vertically on your tongue, there is a tendency that the brush may go inwards more than the way you wanted it to go. And that is when you start retching. But we advise that when you're brushing your tongue, you brush, you keep your toothbrush horizontally. The tongue is divided into two parts, okay? You brush the, the one half, placing your brush horizontally, because when it is horizontally placed, you find out that it can't go deeper than you want it. You, you, you wouldn't want it to go, okay? You brush out the first half, and then you brush out the second half, and then you rinse your mouth. When you're done rinsing your mouth, always remember to rinse your toothbrush. And please, don't ever put your toothbrush back into the pack after you're done brushing. Always put it in, in a standing position. It could be a cup, it could be anything. The reason is that you will give the toothbrush the opportunity to be aerated and eventually get dried up and prevent the growth of microorganisms on the tooth bristle of the toothbrush. Mm. I, think, I think now we are done with the brushing of the teeth. Mm. Apart from the toothbrush, there are other materials that can be used in cleaning the teeth. We have what we call dental floss. What do we use the dental floss for? In fact, before now, this dental floss comes in a thread, in a thread-like form that you wind it around your finger to use it to clean the dirt in between your teeth. But beautifully, technology has made it easier for us. They now put it in a stick like this that you can easily, you, it is used for the removing food remnants in between the teeth like when you eat your meat you eat your mango your garden egg your guava whatever it is that you know get that gets stuck to the to the um in it's between the teeth okay the proximal surfaces that's what we call them in between the teeth this once the dental floss goes in the moment it comes out it definitely must come out with anything that is there there is also this aspect of it that looks like a toothpick, but not exactly like a toothpick. If you look at it very well, you see that it is wedged shape. It is wedge shaped. And this wedge shape is the way the in-between of the teeth is shaped. So we, 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 we discourage the use of what we call toothpick, which is actually cocktail meat pick. We discourage the use of it and we advise that people make use of this dental floss so as to preserve the tissues of the teeth, the gum, and every other surrounding tissue. Mm. Thank you so much, Oji Happiness, for that demonstration. And uh, I, I would like to uh, quickly also ask uh, Dr. Aniabo, so the Nigerian Dental Therapist Association, they go by the acronym NDTA, Enugu State Chapter. You, you were celebrating the World Oral Health Day. Tomorrow is the 20th, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So, what is it about? I mean, uh, I'm not sure I've heard that before, but I'm sure I know things like that have been celebrated. But maybe this the first time it's just on my face. So, what's so special about the celebration here? Okay, Mr. Alex. Um, you see, World Oral Health Day celebration it starts and ends the other time. In fact, as we are celebrating tomorrow's. Um, 2024 World Oral Health Day. We are starting it till the next. Uh -huh. So, like I said, it's to create awareness. It's to make people to get to know what they should do to make their teeth last for them. For instance, from what we are taught now, you see that if you don't brush your teeth well, the gums will recede. You lose your gum. And once you lose your gum, except maybe you start going for surgery to put them back, you know, which is very expensive, very extensive. So, but this normal brushing helps. So that's what World Oral Health Day celebration is all about. For you to get to know 
for you to be educated, for you to be aware, for you to be enlightened. Don't take um, sugary food. Don't eat, um, um, uh, what is it called? Um, biscuits, um, soft drinks, cake, all this refined sugar, refined carbohydrate. That's what you are advocating. But if you must do them, use water to rinse your mouth. Many parents today, you know, pack food. Um, they give them all this refined carbohydrate instead of maybe fruits, natural fruits. So what we advocate in this World Oral Health Day celebration is for you to make a change because dental therapies actually does oral uh, um, hygiene, um, I mean dietary counseling, like telling you what and what to eat. Like we've said, biscuits, chocolate, ice cream, and all these things, they are not good for the teeth. They are the things that cause dental problem. If you must use them, if you must eat them, use water to rinse your mouth after each intake. It's very, very important. And that's why World Oral Health Day celebration is all about. There are other technicalities, but basically to a layman, it's for you to get to know. Like we're educating you now, we're telling you what to do and what not to do to prevent dental problem. Mm. All right. Uh, OG happiness. Uh, the theme is a happy mouth a happy body so <laughs> why can you give us a little insight on that theme thank you very much Alex a happy mouth a happy body let me start from the fact that when you're not confident about how your teeth are you will not smile smiles and laughters are signs of happiness but when something is wrong you're having pains, or there is halitosis, or there's a bleeding gum, you will not, the mouth is not happy, and the body is not happy because the mouth is part of the body. Secondly, when the oral health is how it should be, a lot of other diseases could be limited. Alex, let me tell you, do you know that in the medical practice, there are a lot of diseases that have oral manifestation. A lot of diseases like we have in diabetes, we have in, uh, in um, even, even the retroviral disease, they have their oral epilepsy, they all have their oral manifestations. And most times, a, a patient may just walk in, maybe for a, just for a regular dental checkup, and you see certain unusual things and you begin to ask questions. This is not normal. This is not normal. What is going on? And that is when you find out that there is a problem with the body. Because that mouth is not happy, that means that the body is not happy too. But when the mouth is happy, it, means, it simply means that a healthy mouth could actually translate to a healthy body. Mm. So that is why we advocate that people take good care of their mouth when you come in regularly for your checks, if there's anything that is coming up, it will be nipped at the board. If there's a tooth that is about to develop a decay, we'll catch it early and we'll take care of it early. You, the mouth will be happy, you will smile, and you'll have a wonderful time, and you'll be happy and you'll be productive. Mm. That is actually the theme for this year. Yeah. A happy mouth, a happy body. Great. And on that note, we're, we're actually out of time. And I have to thank both of you and of course, OGE Happiness, Assistant Director, Dental Therapist, University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital, to Koazala. And we will thank you for coming on the program and offering these explanations. And Dr. Anya Boso Kelechi, Assistant Director, Dental Therapist, University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital, to Koazala, and State Chairman of the Nigerian Dental Therapist Association, NDTA, Enugu State Chapter. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking thank your you, time. Alex to school our people on how to smile again uh, yeah. and feel like a million naira. Uh, <laughs> All right. Thank you for having Thank you, Thank you. Much, Thank you so much. Us. And that's the Eastern Eye here on Asia TV. I'm sure here on out, we'll take better care of our oral health. Up next is Nka with favor. My name is Alex Obodo. Good night. Mm -hmm.